This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. And if you've been following along, you know that we are working our way chapter by chapter, section by section through Rothbard's magnum opus, Man, Economy, and State. And this is really one of the few if not only podcasts out there where we're not afraid of books and substantive economic discussion and learning. So that's really the whole idea. And each week we bring on a special guest to help our listeners work through these books and and make it a little more lively, a little more interesting, a little more digestible. And if you recall, uh, last week we had Dr. Walter Block with us, and we had a nice little lesson from him on monopoly theory, which Uh, Rothbard uh, made great strides with in chapter 10 of this book, uh, writing that in the 1950s, when a lot of that was very radical thinking. And we're continuing now on to chapter 11, which is titled Money and Its Purchasing Power. And I thought there'd be nobody better as a guest on this topic and for this chapter than our great friend Bob Murphy. So that said, good morning, Bob, and happy Friday. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, Love the work you're doing on this podcast and glad to be here. Well, I want to mention that Bob is also the author of the study guide to this book, to which we have from time to time referred, and um, we have that available at our site if if you want to uh, obtain that. helps you read the book perhaps a little bit easier. But Bob, I want to preface uh, with a couple of quick comments. Uh, You know, first of all, that he, he goes through the production of interest rates in an earlier chapter about production, about how stuff goods and services arrive at the economy. He doesn't cover interest rates per se in this later chapter about money. So I think that's interesting. And second, I was flipping through uh, Human Action again last night, and there's no direct analog to this chapter in Human Action. In other words, Mises scatters his treatment of interest rates and money and other things, supply and demand for money, uh, throughout the book in a way, whereas Rothbard sort of decides we're going to take a whole chapter a long one, by the way, over 100 pages, and tackle this issue. Yeah. So let me hit the second point you made there uh, first. So you're right. Uh, I never thought of it like that, but you're right. Going through human action, there is no – you can't point to where does Mises talk about how the level of money prices or why that's the wrong way to think about it and, you know, MV equals PT and that sort of thing. Um you're right. He doesn't talk about that. I suppose in the theory of money and credit, maybe that's that's probably where he would do something like that. But you would think in human action, that's where it'd be. And I think it is just kind of the style of the two books that human action's more like a, a like here's Mises' worldview, whereas Rothbard, this really is supposed to be like a treatise on economic theory, and this is this is the body of economic thought. And so I, I think that's partly the explanation for that. Um, and then the first thing you said, right? The in, in a in a Keynesian framework. Money and interest rates would be intimately related, and yet here, because in the Austrian school, interest is you know has to do with time preference, and money has to do with like the the quantity of money has to do with its purchasing power, things like that. So the two really aren't fundamentally related conceptually, and so that's why yes, in, in Rothbard's book earlier he talks about how to, you know changing the interest rate and what does that do to the structure of production, whereas money and its purchasing power that's a completely separate thing conceptually. Well, I want to start with talking about this concept of cash balance. We had an event actually in Birmingham a couple weeks ago where we talked about this, and I talked about uh, Hutt has an an article which is somewhat famous called The Yield from Money Held. And as Rothbard points out here, if we had an evenly rotating economy with no uncertainty, people wouldn't really hold cash balances. They would just know what amount of cash they needed and when they needed it. But it is precisely when things get uncertain in America 2020 – uh, sure feels a hell of a lot more uncertain than America 2019, that we should expect, as Rothbard explains, that people hold more cash. And contra our friends who believe in stimulus uber alles and demand side everything, uh, th- this actually has a, a perfectly rational economic and social function to have more cash when you're not sure maybe about your paycheck down the road or uh, you know, how, you know, whether you're going to have a job in six months. Right. And so, and this is I, I love this stuff. And for people who are just, you know, like especially young people, like I'm thinking of, you know, teenagers who are getting into this stuff, and they start reading more serious economic things. I remember when I went through this and, and understood the framework that Rothbard laid out here, like just how it was. Oh, wow. It was just so systematic and so different. So unfortunately, most people think of when they're thinking about money, 
they think of it moving around the economy, like in the very phrase, the velocity of circulation and that famous equation, MB equals either PT or PQ, depending on how you learned it, that V stands for velocity. And so the, the idea is that, oh, when it comes to money, the way we th they're viewing it almost like an like as an engineer looking at water moving through a pipe. And if you think about it, that is completely divorced from subjective value theory. Like that's not how you explain anything else in economics. That's like looking at it like an engineer. And so the Austrians, they didn't invent this framework, but they adopted it, incorporated it into what's considered, you know, canonical Austrian theory is that when it comes to money and how do people value it and how do you explain decisions regarding money on the margin? It's the same thing that in equilibrium, every piece of money is held in somebody's cash balance. So don't think of it as money is changing hands is the essence of money. No, the essence of money is people are holding it because they get utility from holding it. And then you go through, well, why do they do that? And so uh, just right now, everybody has a certain amount of cash in their wallet or their purse or wherever they keep it. And just ask yourself, why is that? And, you know, clearly, like you say, Jeff, it has to do with uncertainty in the sense that, well, I might need to buy something and maybe I don't want to have to use my debit card or maybe I need to buy something where it's I won't want to have to use or maybe they won't take a debit card or whatever. And so that's why you have cash on you just about at all times when you leave the house. And so that's the essence of it. And, and just realizing that that's why people hold it. So, yes, when situations change. And it's more on the future is, is there's bigger threats looming or you're less sure of how things are going to go. You might bulk up on that. But even in, quote, normal times, why is it that you have $62 in your wallet rather than one quarter? And it's because you say, well, I might be in a situation where I would rather have more cash. And especially when interest rates are positive, you're realizing there is an opportunity cost there. So the cash in your wallet must be doing something. And as you say, you know, Hutt spelled it out in a nice essay saying, it gives you utility. Just holding it makes you feel better than not having it. And that's why people are willing to hold literal currency, even though if they invested it in another asset, they could earn a yield. So let's say I want a Ford F-150. And the new 2020s are unbelievable, by the way. But I, I don't want to stroke that ungodly check for $50,000 or whatever they cost. So in Hutt's conception... I'm sort of buying that cash or the psychic uh, satisfaction I get from having the cash instead of the F-150. Am I saying that correctly? Right. So it's a true statement just to say, you know, why is it that you refrain from purchasing on the margins? Because, oh, that additional Ford F-150, in your case, maybe it means you're going from you'd be going from zero to one units of it is not, you know, it, it has less subjective value to you than you value it less subjectively than the you know, if you have $60,000 in cash in your checking account, then more than the 10,000 and once through the 60,000th dollars in terms of, you know, just standard marginal value theory, that's the way you would explain it. So those are true statements. If you refrain from the exchanges, because the thing you're, you're, the cash you're maintaining possession of, you value more highly on the margin than the thing you could trade it for. Just like if you say, if I don't give my bologna sandwich to Sally's for her peanut butter sandwich at school and your little kids trading lunch sandwiches, that's how you would explain it. So the, the same principles apply to money. It's just with money, it's a little bit weird to think through, well, how does money give me utility? And it has to do with its purchasing power. So this is the stuff Mises solved in his 1912 theory of money and credit. Like, because it at first, it does seem a bit contrived or that you're arguing in a circle to say, oh, the reason we value money is because money has purchasing power. Because why does it have purchasing power? Because people value it. So it looks like you're arguing a circle, but Mises, you know, worked through the, the kinks of that and saw that it showed that it wasn't circular. But yes, that that is the the way you explain things. Just it's subjective value theory. But Bob, have you noticed they almost sort of beat you up? There's this concept, you know, of hoarding that you're not doing your fair share. Let's say you're a restaurant owner, and a year ago you had that sixty grand, and your restaurant was booming, and you would have thought, hey, we're doing great. I'm going to buy. I'm going to buy that Ford F-150 because I want it. And let's say for whatever reason you didn't. And now a year later, your restaurant is barely open because of COVID. You're doing 10%. And you still got that $60,000 sitting there. And you don't go buy the Ford F-150. You're like, man, I don't know if my restaurant's even going to make it to the end of the year. That, 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 you know, the implication, what I get as a lay reader of all this stuff is that that this guy is somehow being seen as a bad actor. He ought to take that 60000 and go stimulate the economy. But why isn't he – in other words, he's not performing any social function by hoarding it. 
Right. Yeah. So you're exactly right, Jeff, that that's the, you know, the very term hoarding. That's what it suggests. And, and Mitt Rothberg goes out of his way to say, and, and that's partly why I think it's so important. And, and he stresses that the cash balance framework for just explaining in a standard equilibrium, you know, we talk about what, what, what are the prices when things settle down and, you know, there's no shortages or surpluses besides saying, oh, there's not people trying to sell more apples than people want to buy apples. And that's what it means for there to be disequilibrium in the apple market when it comes to the money market. And I don't mean like money market mutual funds. You know, people use the term colloquially. I mean, literally cash balances in equilibrium. Everybody's holding the desired amount of cash in their balance that, you know, equals all the, the amount of money in existence at that moment. So everybody is, quote, hoarding cash at some point. So when, when we say somebody's a hoarder or that he's hoarding cash, what all that really means is that person is holding a larger cash balance than most of us would would do so do if we were in his shoes. Right. It, it, it's not that there's some qualitative difference. And that's that's the, th the important thing to, to realize. It's not that, oh, most of us uh, spend our money. But this guy over here, this antisocial person hoards his that. No, at any moment, you, you when you're you get your paycheck, you don't blow it one second later. You are holding it still. Right. And so th that's kind of the, the essence of it. And it's just when somebody bulks up his cash balances it's because the condition, you know, whatever it was that he determined, this is how much cash I feel comfortable holding two years ago when things seemed, quote, normal, and now conditions have changed and he's bumped up the number. It's not that he's doing something qualitatively different. It's just he's adjusted. Like if, if, the, if the risk of fire went up in your neighborhood and people, instead of having one fire extinguisher in their house, now carry two, even though they might not ever use them. They just feel more comfortable having more on hand in case that situation. Similarly, if you're uncertain of the financial future and instead of having $60,000, now you have a hundred thousand in your checking account, your business checking account. It's, it's a similar type, uh, type of thing. And so the last thing I'll say is again, the, the reason that seems like that to the public, it seems anti-social is they think spending drives the economy. Whereas the Austrians sort of get from the classical school or, or carry through from the classical school, this idea that no, I mean, production really is, fundamentally more about quote real things like what makes us wealthy is our real resources and people's technological knowledge and things like that and money just helps facilitate those exchanges and so doubling the amount of money doesn't make us twice as wealthy it just means you know prices go up a lot so in a big downturn like unfortunately we are experiencing currently a big economic downturn we we hear once again this concept of velocity of money you touched on uh for those who are reading along at page 831 uh, Rothbard goes into a famous work by Irving Fisher, The Purchasing Power of Money. Uh, so, Bob, help us understand, first of all, in the mainstream conception, what's velocity? What's MV equals PT? Uh, what is Irving Fisher talking about? Okay, so MV equals PT was the original. So it's called the equation of exchange. And it's it's not a theory. It, it's a tautology. It's an accounting identity. Like once you understand what those terms mean, it, the thing necessarily is equal. So M stands for the quantity of money, like for U.S. purposes, just think of it as number of dollars. V is the velocity of circulation. Okay. And so what V means is on average, for whatever the time period is, let's say we're talking about one year, how many times on average does a, a dollar bill change hands? So that's what V is. So M times V then would mean, well, if you got the total number of dollars times the amount number of times the average dollar changes hands, then those two multiplied together so, mean... Uh, okay, so cha changes mm -hmm. hands within a certain arbitrary time frame, like what calendar year. Sure. Okay. And and so that so M times V then would mean how many times during this calendar year, for example, did dollars change hands? So it's like the, it's measuring like total spending. And then the right-hand side is P times T. P is the average price level. So for all transactions on average, what's the price level that you know, was, was prevailing and T is the number of transactions. So the average price in a given transaction times the total number of transactions is also going to be the total number of dollars changing hands. If you think through what that means. So that's why the equation is necessarily equal. And so then if you, once you realize that, then you can say things like, Oh, so if we doubled M and V doesn't change, that means MV doubles. So then on the right-hand side, you know that that's got to double. And so if the number of transactions stayed the same, then P would have to double. But on the other hand, like if the amount of transactions went up, then P doesn't need to go up as much. You know, so you can say things like that. Or if doubling M goes hand in hand with velocity getting cut in half, well, then prices don't need to change. Okay, so once you have that equation, you can sit there and, and say things like that. 
But again, Mises and then Rothbard following him rejected that. There's lots of things wrong with that framework. Like I said, one of it is there's no subjective value in there. It's just looking at the economy the way like an engineer or mechanic would. Um, But also beyond that, like those V and uh, P, those are like, what does it mean? The the average number of times a dollar changes hands. That's the only way you would know what that is, is a, is a placeholder in that equation, right? In other words, that's kind of this weird thing that no individual, no individual actor in the economy cares about how many times on average does a dollar change hands, right? It's just kind of a thing that you would plug in that equation to make the equation balance. So it's a very mechanistic uh, framework. And it also, I think one of the reasons Mises didn't like it too is that, so the equation is necessarily true. It's not a theory. What is a theory is when you say things like, hey, I think in the long run, money doesn't affect output or the number of transactions. It would just affect P. So therefore, doubling M doubles P in the long run, right? So that's a theory because you're assuming certain relationships among those things. And Mises thought that that was too many economists too readily just assumed a proportional or a change in M would proportionally affect prices when in reality he thought, no, the money enters the economy at specific entry points and that causes distortions. And that's like the basis of his theory of the business cycle. If it were true that new quantities of money entering the economy affected all prices simultaneously and proportionally, you wouldn't have the Austrian business cycle. So so MV equals PT is is correct. It's a tautology of sorts. But but so the point here, from our perspective anyway, or Rothbard's perspective, I should mm-hmm. say, is that velocity is kind of a bogus concept. W- right. That the only – yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you can define it. Like, what does it mean? But nobody would use it. And, the, and, in fact, really, when you define what do I mean by it, you would really just be saying, oh, well, what V is, is PT divided by M. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's not like it has this independent – existence is a conceptual thing that, you know, you'd be carrying around with you and mm-hmm. say, oh, when I plug in this equation, look at how it relates everything else. It's really, you know, that's all you really mean by it is in relationship to the other variables in that equation. Right. And I think Hoppe even talks about this in his article about Hutt's article, which I mentioned earlier, the yield for money held, that this idea of money circulating, I mean, right now, let's say money is in my either cash balance in my pocket or in my checking account, electronic blip somewhere on a computer, in a server somewhere, actually in a cloud somewhere, I guess. And so it's sitting there, and I go to, I stop by Walmart on my way home and get some Diet Coke. Okay, so it goes from my balance to, to Walmart's. But it, d- does that mean that it's, it, I mean, when I hear velocity, it makes me think of one of those experiments with mice, where if you put the same amount of mice in a smaller area, they sort of ping around each other more. And it, it, it sounds like the, there's this this implied notion that more velocity is better, and we want everybody pinging around, and, and we want Walmart to immediately take that $5 bill from Jeff and go spend it somewhere else, and that this is all beneficial. But that's, that all sounds like motion, not action. Yeah, exactly right. And that's that's kind of what I was getting. You're thinking of it in terms of mice. I think of it in terms of it, the, the the metaphor it raises for me is looking at the economy like a bunch of pipes and there's water going through it. And that's how they're viewing the money. The money's moving around. And hey, if the money's not moving around, then something's wrong. We're going to be stuck in a in a slump. And and you're right. So the, the, the hoarder is a villain in that framework because, oh, the Fed's doing what it can. It's printing new money and injecting it, but these hoarders are just sitting on it. So that's you know negating the beneficiary, beneficial effects of this inflation. Um, and, and right, so the, the cash balance approach, in contrast, is not analyzing things in terms of money moving around. It's saying, it, it, it take a snapshot at any given moment in the economy, every dollar bill is in someone's possession, right? So even when you're, so people are thinking of it as, like you say, your example, Jeff, you buying something, Coke, I think you said it from Walmart, the Keynesian approach is viewing it as you, you know, you giving money over to them and that's stimulating sales and whatever. But originally you decide you had the cash balance, then things change and you decide you preferred the Coke. But Walmart is deciding it would rather have your cash than the Coke on the margin, right? And so Walmart is taking the cash into its possession. So it's not that at any moment there's money in circulation to be contrasted with money sitting idle in cash balances, and, and that's 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 kind of the the distinction between the two approaches, and I think it's much more helpful to to understand you know why is it that people would be content to hold money in their cash balances? What what function is that serving? And once you realize that, then everything falls into place. 
So one of the things Rothbard talks about in this book is, of course, the supply, the supply of money, and he goes into a lot of demand curves and that sort of thing. Um, but the overarching point that I get from his discussion, which is also one that I think he gets, he makes quite simply later on in his career in What Has Government Done to Our Money, that great little essay, is that you know we don't care per se about the supply of money, right? Prices can adjust. You can have a, a big supply or a small supply. That's, and we'll get into this later. Purchasing power is what matters. The, the, the supply per se is not the thing. Right, exactly. And, and so there's different ways. And again, a lot of this stuff, like the classical economists had this wisdom and then you know, just their value theory was flawed and that you know, Menger had to, had to fix it. Um, so yeah, there, there's different ways of phrasing, but Rothbard says things along the lines of any amount of money or any quantity of money – is optimal in the sense that it can fulfill the functions of a medium of exchange. And mm -hmm. so the idea is like, like in contrast with any other good, whether consumption or production good, you know, if, if we double the number of cars in the economy, that would be a good thing. We would be richer if we double the amount of coal we had or so forth, of arable farmland. But to just double the number of dollars we had, that doesn't make us wealthier. All that would really do in the long run is make prices go up a lot. And so that doesn't make us wealthier. So th that's the idea. But yet, notice, money still serves a function. It's not that money is useless. It's just, as you say, Jeff, once prices adjust to the quantity of money or the supply of money, then it's able to fulfill all the important functions that, that money does for us. Whereas with other goods, that's the more of it you have, other things equal, the, the better it is. So, I mean, if there's more cars, then that that's good for car consumers mm -hmm. and bad maybe for Detroit automakers. But the you know the gains to the winners are better than the losses to the losers. Where with, with money, it's the, you know at it, it best it's a wash, and if it's unexpected, it might make, lead people to make miscalculations because they don't realize what's happening, and so actually it makes us worse off. So and, and also with this stuff too, we mean money in its role as a medium of exchange. So if like gold is the money, obviously the more gold there is, the more dental fillings and jewelry and and things like that people can get. So that's good. But in terms of gold just serving as being in coins and serving as the money, the more of it you have, that doesn't make us wealthier. That would just mean prices quoted in gold ounces would be higher than they otherwise would be. Well, here's a possible point of confusion sometimes and a charge that is uh, leveled at Austrians. You know, People mistakenly think because Austrians view inflation as a monetary phenomenon and price increases as a later symptom that we are somehow adherents – of the quantity theory of money. And there's a couple points, uh, places in human action where Mises debunks this. And so we understand, or I, I just want our audience to understand that a huge increase in the supply of money doesn't necessarily mean, you know, an old iPhone 4 can still be deflating in price and value in people's subjective uh, conception. It, that, that price can still be going down because nobody wants an old iPhone, regardless of how much new money is coming in. So we, we don't believe in a quantity theory of money. Right. And there's different things that people mean by that phrase. So like a very weak version, just saying the level, the, 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 side, the height of various prices is related to the quantity of money. Okay. Yeah. Austrians would endorse that view, but right. If you have a very mechanistic view saying, if you increase the quantity of money by 20%, that means in the long run, all prices go up 20%, or at least an index of prices go... Right, that's the kind of thing that Mises took pains to to say, no, we don't believe that. He always referred to the driving uh, force of money or the non-neutrality of money. And like I said, it, it's particularly important for people to realize that if they like the Austrian school, because Mises' whole theory of the business cycle relies on that mechanism. The fact that when new money enters the economy through the credit market, it, it distorts interest rates first before... It, you know, distorts the other prices, and that's what gives rise in Mises' view to the unsustainable boom. So the the Austrian theory of the business cycle is only possible because Mises believes in the non-neutrality of money, meaning a very simplistic version of the quantity theory of money has to be false. So when we think about that, when we say money's never neutral, uh, Rothbard takes pains here to point out, he says, well, first of all, you know, let's say Congress creates some new stimulus, uh, you know, another round of stimulus late in 2020 because everybody's unemployed and people aren't paying their rent and mortgages. It's absolutely horrible. And Congress will probably do that, by the way. And Trump is trying to do that by executive order to help his own election chances. So this is not uh, rhetorical. Okay, this is happening. 
Um, let's say there's some huge federal stimulus passed here in the next couple of months. Well, f- first of all, Rothbard points out, as a technical or practical matter, even in a digital age today, which he couldn't have imagined in the 50s writing this, it, it never, ever enters everyone's cash balance sheet at the same time. I mean, we, we don't know where everyone is. We've got dead people getting checks. We've got, you know, little toddlers without an account. I mean, it's just an absolute mess with 320 million people. So, so as a, even today, as a technical or practical matter, that can't happen. So some people are going to get the money quicker and sooner. And, and of course, that happens in a very different way with, like, Wall Street bankers who get lots of new money earlier in, in more roundabout ways, in more monetary policy ways than fiscal policy ways. But, but he, he go, Rothbard goes a step further. I thought this was interesting. I hadn't thought of this. Which, even if you could do that, even if you could magically say we're going to double the amount of, of U.S. currency and everyone's going to get it instantaneously at the same time, you know, everyone's everyone that that uh, restaurateur with sixty grand is all of a sudden going to have one hundred and twenty tomorrow. Even if you could do that, you know, it would still be non-neutral because some people would spend it sooner rather than later, and so they would, in, I, I suppose, avail themselves of uh, there. There might be a rush to go out and avail your, the, yourself of the current price level before it goes up. Right, exactly. Um, so let me just for people to try to understand Rothbard's l- logic there. So I think everybody realizes if, if the government just printed enough dollars so that everyone had a million dollars, it couldn't possibly be the case that we would all just be millionaires next Thursday, right? In the sense of what we th- think of as a millionaire now and the stuff that that person can afford, that could you know because there's not going to be more houses or more cars or more uh, you know cruise lines and whatnot. The things that you might go spend the money on. There's not more of those available, so clearly it can't be that everybody can just quit their job and, and retire. That can't be true. So what what would actually happen to make that not come true is that, oh, gee, if everybody got a million dollars tomorrow, they would go out and try to spend it, and clearly the prices of everything would go way up. So that in the new equilibrium, bread would be whatever, $100 a loaf and so on, so that having a million dollars in the bank actually wouldn't be that much anymore. And on average, people couldn't be better off so at best, all it would be is a wash on average. And then, but what the Austrian point about the non neutrality money is, it's not merely that everybody is the same. Some people could be better off. It's just there must be losers as well. And so when you think through, okay, well, how does that happen then in practice? It's got to be the case that, okay, as prices start rising, those who quickly run out and spend that new influx of money, like if their quantity of cash doubled, they might be able to go out and hit the stores and buy things before prices in general have risen. And so they do benefit, right? So if you got your million dollars first and went out and bought a bunch of stuff and then everyone else in the country got a million dollars, you actually would be better off. You might be glad at that experiment, but everybody else clearly on average would be worse off. So, so that's, that's the idea. And, and so, as he says, it's, there's two problems with the, the, the doctrine of the neutrality money. Number one is it's, imp- it's actually not true that everybody's, could proportionally have their cash balances rise by the same amount instantaneously. But as you say, Jeff, even if that did happen still, because people are different, some would spend it, you know, more quickly than others. And they would tend to gain. Whereas the people who were slow to the draw prices would start rising while they were sitting on their cash balances. And so it would lose the the way to think about it is their assets locked up in currency if there's 30% price inflation, they would take a bigger hit than the people who weren't holding much of their wealth in the form of actual currency when the prices were rising. So that's another way of thinking about why is it there's winners and losers. That's If that helps people for it to click, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. Well, if we're right, if Mises is right that money is never neutral, what are the implications of that for, I, I think, mostly well-intentioned people advocating things like MMT? modern monetary theory and a universal basic income, for example. Uh, ha- have they grappled with this? Uh, I think yes and no. So yes, in the sense that I think the MMT people would say, right, we don't think it's neutral. We think it's going to help. It's going to make us richer to dump new money <laughs> in the economy. But I think mm. no in the sense that what the Austrians mean by that when you explain, well, how is, how is money not neutral and they explain all the ways it can distort things and how it you know changes relative prices but doesn't actually create more real wealth and so forth you know it clearly the mmt people don't get that because if they did then they would be against the the proposal so i think it's just their view of how the economy works 
is so fundamentally different from the Austrians. The MMT people think that we can have idle resources just languishing for decades on end because there's not enough demand if only the government would create more money, whereas the Austrians realize that, well, no, the, the reason during a recession there's, quote, idle resources is because of the preceding boom, and if the authorities just st you know stayed out of it and let prices adjust, those resources would get reallocated to where they're supposed to be, and then you wouldn't have another boom bust cycle. So the the MMT people keep sowing the seeds of the of the of the next boom bust cycle if we were to follow their proposals. But but again, so it's it's actually the Chicago school who are the hyper like new, money is neutral people thinking that oh yeah you. You, you can't even have, a, like, a boom's not even a sensible concept, depending on which Chicago person you're talking about. So I guess the MMT people, I'm guessing, would say money's not neutral. We can use it as a force for social good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if anybody out there is not up to speed on MMT, which is something that actually is gaining traction in a political sense, I would, I would argue, uh, Bob wrote a great review of a, of a newish book by Professor Stephanie Kelton called The Deficit Myth. And you can just go to Mises.org and uh, Google that, and you'll find uh, Bob's excellent review, which not only reviews the book, but really lays out what MMT is and, and does a good job, uh, you know, a, a, a good job of respectfully addressing and considering the arguments that the MMTers make. So that, that's the kind of thing where I think we can provide value in having these kinds of debates. Uh, so, Bob, you know, we, we've talked about cash balances. We've talked about... Uh, the money supply. We've talked about the non-neutrality of it. So what, what I think most of our listeners care about, of course, is the purchasing power of the money they do have. So talk us through this. Rothbard takes pains to point out that the purchasing power of money is, is a different concept and differs from the rate of interest. So what, on the one hand, we're talking about supply and demand for money. And on the other hand, we are talking about time preference when it comes to interest rates. So, so conceptually, how do we separate these two things? Okay, sure. So, yeah, the, the purchasing power of money, or you can think of it as the price of money, and maybe this is a good way of distinguishing, you know, these two things that Rothbard's worried that people often conflate. So, colloquially, people will say, oh, yeah, interest is the price of money, because they think of it as if I need to get more cash, I got to go to a bank and borrow it, and they're going to charge me interest. But that's actually, I mean, more technically, that's the price of borrowing money. Okay, so the price of buying money, like, what would that even mean? It's like, oh, what, what do you have to exchange in order to become the owner of more money? And when you think of it that way, it means, oh, you're selling goods and services, right? So the store, when it's selling Diet Coke for whatever, $5 for a certain amount, you know, they're buying money at the rate of $5 per this many number of units of, of Coke. And so, the, so what the purchasing power of money is, is just the inverse of standard prices, so that's the the kind of weird thing when it comes to money. That's the everything else's price is measured in money, or quoted in money. Whereas the price of money, when you say, "Well, what's the price of a ten dollar bill?" Well, it would be ten dollars. So that's not what people mean. That's obvious. It means what can you go out and exchange a ten dollar bill for in the economy? That's what its purchasing power is. And so then, you know, interest rates. Again, it's it's not that interest isn't what you have to pay to become the owner of money. It's rather, you know, what do you have to pay to rent money if that's the way you want to think about it? And that's a different thing. And so, for example, if they double the amount of money and prices in general rise a lot, and again, I'm not going to say prices double because that would assume money is completely neutral. But if in, the interest rate originally is 10% and all of a sudden they double the quantity of money, it's not that, oh, once things settle down, the interest rate is going to be 20%. You know, because because it's it's like both sides of the money have become weaker, right? So think of it this: way. when you're borrowing money, if money becomes weaker because of inflation, then there's two things going on: that the the money you're borrowing is weaker, but and so you might think that oh, so the interest rate should come down, but then that also means the money the the dollars you're paying for the interest are weaker also. So there's no reason. In other words, if the original interest rate is ten percent. Once things settle down the new equilibrium, unless time preferences have changed because of the redistribution of wealth, you would expect the interest rate to still be 10%. In contrast, you know, if a car was $20,000 and they double the amount of money in the economy, then when things settle down, you'd expect that car to be, you know, it might not be exactly 40,000, but it would be a lot higher. So th that's that's the thing and just I encourage the listener to to think through that that there's no reason that the interest rate 
in the long run is going to be higher or lower because there's more money in the in existence. And that's because the interest rate is measuring like money exchanging. It's, it's like present dollars changing for future dollars. So the fact that dollars become weaker doesn't change that ratio. Yeah, here's what strikes me as strange, Bob, about a lot of our economist friends on the left, which is that on the one hand, they want to deal totally in empirical data and they're dismissive of praxeology and the idea of studying human action, what humans actually do uh, based on axioms or deductive knowledge. But on the other hand, they're a little dismissive of this idea that incentives matter. You know, the MMTers want to say, oh, you know, this you, you, you create all this new money and there's not going to be any of X, Y, or Z as a result. So that strikes me as odd because if you take your example earlier, if everyone gets a million bucks, you know, we're all a millionaire in terms of our nominal bank account, uh, people might respond very differently. There might be a little old lady out there who's been super frugal her whole life who wouldn't change a thing, wouldn't do a thing with that million dollars. It would just sit in her bank balance because it's just who she is. She's very, very frugal. And there might be some sort of loud, brash, spendthrift kind of guy who's always got flashy cars and watches or something like that who immediately burns through the million and then is still borrowing money, right? It's, you know, so he's still affecting the market of interest rates with his own high time preference for stuff now. So it's, it's not so easy to just engineer the economy, I think, the way a, a lot of a, a lot of Krugman types and MMT types think. That's, so that's my comment. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right about that. And I mean, I'm, I'm using a different example or analogy to it, but it is funny that, yeah, the people who say, oh, you know, they, these right wingers, they think that taxes drive behavior. But no, I mean, there's look at the tax rates in the 50s and 60s. And but yet they're all agreed that, oh, if you want to get people to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, we got to have a carbon tax. Like that's just straightforward. So in certain contexts, they understand full well that when you tax something, you get less of it. Or why do we have to have so-called sin taxes? Well, because smoking's bad for you. That's why we got to have really high uh, tax rates on cigarettes and so forth. So they get that in certain contexts. But then, you know, when it comes to taxing work effort, for some reason, they think that incentives don't matter. Mm. Well, there's this section in this chapter about where Rothbard deals with really sort of the nuts and bolts of banking, you know, 100% reserve banking and warehouse banking. And he explains to us the concept of fiduciary media. And then he goes into uh, other types of commodities that have money attributes, well, like uh, certain, like we might say U.S. Treasury bonds and that sort of thing. Uh, but what struck me as I was reading through this again, Bob, is first of all, it's a good little uh, tight explication of a lot of the concepts that uh, people may be a little fuzzy on, you know, the sort of little, the slightly more mechanistic aspects of banking and full reserve versus um, um, yeah, partial fractional reserve and all that sort of thing. But what what really sort of frightened me is thinking that he's writing this in the 50s. Imagine today when we talk about shadow banking, for example, there's not a lot of literature there out there on shadow banking. One of our summer fellows a couple of years ago wrote a, a pretty lengthy and dense article on it. Uh, but, you know, the, the amount of money substitutes out there, unbacked money substitutes in the form of like Goldman Sachs bonds and derivatives and all that. I mean, we may have no idea how bad it is. We may not even have a clue as to um, how much sort of money uh, ma is masquerading out there and how much debt is, is acting on all, an awful lot like money in t until we have a really nasty crisis. That, that was just what I took away from that section is that it might be frightening. Right. So, uh, yeah, just to, to respond to that. So th it's funny because somebody might think money and its purchasing power in a chapter in that. Why the heck is Rothbard talking about fraction reserve banking? And it's because – it, it, yeah, the framework for how do you analyze money and its purchasing power is the supply of and demand for money. And then so the, in the supply of money, if there's fractional reserve banking, there is a very legitimate sense in which commercial banks – and this is – I'm just stressing this because I even didn't fully get this when I was younger. It's not just that the Federal Reserve right now post-1971 can create new dollars. Even Bank of America, when it grants a loan, creates dollars – at a, at a certain level, like measuring in terms of like M1, for example, if people know those monetary errors. So it can't create what's called base money or legal tender money, but it certainly 
claims on Bank of America, if you think you have money in your checking account, there's a sense in which that's money, even though it's not money in the same way that a $100 bill is. And so with, under fractional reserve banking, banks themselves, by making loans, can expand the quantity of money and in what Mises called money in the broader sense. And so that's why that stuff's in this chapter. And so I think you're, you're right, Jeff, and, and Rothbard did get into it and say, well, what about certain like gems or something that he called quasi-money? And think so. It it is interesting to really nail down what's the definition of this stuff, and you know it's it's not that any financial asset is like money. Like there's there's specific criteria for it, but I think you're right. So the and I got into this. I had this guy Rowan Gray on my podcast, Jeff, when we went for like two and a half hours, and he was talking about this stuff. And so I think, and he was bringing up things like, well, there's private credit creation. Like if if your local bartender you know lets you run a tab, that's private credit creation, and that. Mm-hmm. And so I think the fundamental difference, though, is, or at least it's a it's a quantitative difference, is that certain things are not widely accepted in the community. So that kind of contains their impact. So the reason commercial banks being able to issue loans is so is the source of the business cycle in Mises framework is that the community accepts claims on Bank of America at par with actual currency. Right when you swipe your debit card. It's not that the grocery store says, wait a minute, if, we're, if you're going to pay with Bank of America claims, <laughs> you know, this $100 tab is going to be 110 whereas if you give me a $100 bill, then we'll say we're good. The, you know, it, it exchanges at par. So whereas if you went in and said, you know what, my bartender um, it gives me a $1,000 line of credit, and so let me just transfer 200 of that to you, they would say, what are you talking about? You know, they wouldn't even accept that. So, so that's the kind of thing. So yes, with the shadow banking stuff, we would it would be empirical in the sense of you'd have to go and see – certain like short-term loans or whatnot or credit that institutions offer like how how much is the, how widely is that accepted and so on and it, and it may be that yes there are these huge pockets of it and it's it's not something you could know just in, uh by definition you'd have to go out i think and look and see how widely is this stuff accepted because and, and mises you know he talks about that that that's that's why he comes up with this term fiduciary media that he, and he says there's a sense in which, hey, you know, a claim on a bank that's immediately redeemable and the community doesn't doubt it at all is a medium of exchange that's widely accepted. So why don't we just call it money? And he says, well, because it's a claim, you know, it's an it's mm-hmm. interesting thing. So that's why he comes up with this framework. But yeah, to the extent that some of these other things became widely accepted, then I guess, yeah, you'd have to roll them also into this notion of fiduciary media and they could in principle cause the boom bust cycle. Well, U.S. Treasury debt isn't a claim on a bank per se. It's more a claim on the United States itself and its treasury. But, I mean, there are trillions of, of – nominated in dollars, but there's trillions of U.S. Treasury U, – trillions in U.S. Treasury debt held by all kinds of pension funds, by all kinds of big investment funds, uh, by all kinds of central banks around the world. And I would argue that they, they hold those almost as quasi-money, right, as a – as something that's not quite as liquid as the dollar, but awfully close. I'm, am I thinking about this correctly? Uh, so here, this is just me. I, I'm not. I'm not. Wouldn't bet my life on how would Mises, Mises or Rothbard talk about it. But I think the the thing you got to be careful about is are they immediately re- redeemable? Mm-hmm. Um, and so certainly short term, like a you know a, a treasury bill that's going to you know come due next week or something. I think that would be you know, much more of a money substitute than, you know, something that's long-term. In other words, mere liquidity, if it's not denominated, so this is what I'm trying to say, that if you go to sell a 30-year treasury bond, that's, you're not guaranteed what you're going to get in the market for it, right? If interest rates change, the current market price sure. of that thing adjusts. Sure. So, so that, I guess that's, that's part of the, of the issue um, in terms of, you know, is it, how much of it is a, is a substitute for money? But, but yes, Especially when interest rates are low, very short-term treasury debt is, for many investors, virtually indistinguishable from just holding reserves with the Fed, right? That, you know, like a, a treasury bill that's going to mature next week that is going to give you $1,000, when interest rates are basically 0%, that's almost the same thing as having $1,000 in your FDIC-backed checking account. Because both of them, in a sense, are going to be $1,000 one week from now. So, so yes, when interest rates are low, that there is a sense in which a lot of this stuff becomes pretty close to to money. 
So, Bob, we're almost out of time, but I want to talk about what perhaps makes money good or bad. I think, you know, we all know about money in places like the former Zimbabwe and Argentina in 99 and 2000. I mean, sometimes money goes bad. It goes wrong. And Austrians, in you know, people who are pro-gold standard, people who are pro-crypto tend to talk about the hardness of money. We want a money where the supply can't be quickly increased by politics or by fiat. And so we think that, you know, huge fluctuations – in, in, in fast fluctuations, especially uh, in inflationary situations, are, are a bad thing, and we don't want that to happen to people. We want them to be able to save hard money that will actually retain value over time. So there's this whole concept of hardness. But on the flip side, both Mises and Rothbard here say, you know, we have to, you know, we don't want to worry about stabilization of money. We don't necessarily think that there should be a role. Uh, for the state or the central bank in, in trying to maintain that purchasing power. In other words, the price of money should fluctuate freely uh, vis-a-vis that 12-pack of Diet Coke just as much as, as any other uh, two goods or services. So it, there's a little bit of a tension here that I'm getting. Yeah, exactly. And so Mises, and it's a, a real subtle point, but he would stress and say that um, prices don't measure – the value of goods and services or, you know, that the, they can, they don't measure the value of money. They consist in money. And, you know, at first he's like, what, what is that even, what distinction is he trying to make? And it, and he would, would stress that money is not a measuring rod of value. Right. And so there is this idea and I've seen like, uh, um, even nowadays, a lot of like people on the right who are very, you know, big fans of gold and so on, they might to try to get the reader to understand this to be like, Hey, I mean, you know, if the, if the government's going to establish weights and measures and, you know, the, you wouldn't want them changing the definition of a foot. Now it's 13 inches or, or like how long an inch is, is changes on you. And so likewise, when they debase the currency, that's kind of changing the measuring rod of value. And that's screw- and, and even though you understand where they're coming from and the desire to stabilize things and have this fixed Mises point was no conceptually you're misunderstanding in terms of subjective value theory. It, there, there's no such thing as saying a, you know something that's a stable quantity to measure value because value is the subjective thing. You can't measure it the way you can measure physical length, which is, you know, this extensive quality uh, feature of the objective world, whereas, you know, value is, is in your mind. Um, And so, so it's a, even though yes, rapid fluctuations in the purchasing power of money spook people. And that's why they recoiled and longed for money of a stable purchasing power. Mises would stress that, conceptually that's that's incoherent like you go ahead and try to define what you mean there is no such thing that because again uh you know you could measure things and say oh the dollar is always a certain weight of gold but if there's massive gold discoveries then you know that lowers the exchange ratio like you know makes the dollar or sorry gold on the margin less valuable relative to other goods and services and so there's no way of getting around that and even if you held a quantity fixed like with Bitcoin, for example, you know, once you get to the 21 million, there's not going to be more Bitcoins. But then as other goods and services continue to have their output increased, that's going to make Bitcoin and other things equal more valuable on the margin. So, there, again, there's there's no way of of locking that in. And, and part of what they're what Mises and Rothbard are trying to get across there is you're thinking about it wrong. If you think of money as measuring value, that's not the way to think about it. Like you know, money exchanges for goods and services. So all you know when there's a transaction is – the person who gave up the money valued the goods and services more than the money, and the the seller valued the money more than the goods and services. There's no equality there. It's not that, in other words, when you buy something for a hundred dollars, it's not like you laid a dollar measuring rod and then said, "Oh, I, I can lay it end to end a hundred times to measure the value of this thing." That's not what's happening there. What it's showing is you value the thing you bought more than a hundred dollars. That's why you agreed to the trade, and the seller valued your hundred dollar bill more than the thing he gave up. So there's two inequalities of value. It's not that exchange doesn't indicate some measurement of value going on. So the buyer and the seller of any good or service have their own subjective values, and they, and they arrive at what we might call an exchange ratio, but that doesn't express a value per se. Right. I mean, to, I mean, you could say if you buy whatever, a, a computer game for $100 – that indicates the market value of that game is $100. Or if you mm-hmm. buy a share of stock for $100, you could say right now the market value of that stock is 100 if you want. But their market value just means the price, right? You're just, you're just kind of you know using language loosely. It does not mean the subjective value in the person's head. 
because, or mind, I should say, because that's, again, that's, that's a subjective thing that you can't measure in principle. It's like saying, do you value your best friend 26% more than your second best friend? It's not just that, oh, how could we know? It's that that question really doesn't even make any sense. And of course, I bring this up because there have been efforts across the West uh, over the decades and even in the United States to try to come up with some sort of stabilization of the currency, whether by legislation or by acts of the central bank or whatever. And, and I guess, Bob, in a sense, when there, there was an edict that uh, e- even under a gold standard in the United States, that g- gold would exchange for $35 an ounce at, at a fixed exchange rate, that that w- you know, wouldn't in and of itself guarantee uh, stabilizing the purchasing power of the dollar. Right, exactly. So, you know, Mises was a big fan of of gold as money. And, you know, so you could quibble like, well, does that mean he wants a gold standard or whatnot? But uh, yeah, so you could limit the the quantity and, and the, the function of that. So clearly having the dollar severed from gold, which, full, you know, completely happened in 1971, that unleashed money printing. And so the, the whole rationale for the gold standard from a hard money perspective is it's you got to use real resources to dig up more gold. And so that's going to be a check on it. So, you know, next Thursday, it's not the quantity of gold is going to quadruple, whereas Jay Powell could quadruple the number of dollars in existence by next Thursday if he wanted to. And so so that's the the rationale. But what Mises you know stressed was even if you did have this fixed exchange rate between like the dollar and, and gold, that would certainly limit the inflationary potential of the authorities and, you know, kind of keep their hands tied, but it wouldn't be locking in and saying, ah, now we finally have a fixed measuring rod of value. The way to, you know, to say, oh no, a foot is always 12 inches. And if we have like a a canonical measuring rod somewhere in the Smithsonian to show people, this is what one foot really is. And now we're making rulers that, you know, we try to get real close to this to hand out to people so they can measure stuff. That's not what you're doing when you say, the dollar exchanges for gold at $35 an ounce, even if you obeyed that pledge, because the gold itself could you know, change in value. If all of a sudden there were a bunch of, like I say, mines discovered or some asteroid, you know, Elon Musk figures out how to mine more gold from asteroids or whatever, prices around the world, you know, things, what used to take one ounce of gold to buy might now take two ounces of gold to buy, just because the gold becomes more plentiful. So that would mean the dollar relative to everything else would lose half of its purchasing power, even though it was still locked in. Nope, the dollar to gold is this fixed ratio. The U.S. government guarantees it. Even if they maintain that promise, you can't have gold always exchanging for the same against other goods and services because gold is just a commodity and value is subjective. So you can't force people mentally to value things on the margin the same way. And if you did, that would be a disaster. That was the other thing Mises pointed out. He said the logical implications of it, you wouldn't want to have fixed money because then it wouldn't, you know, people would be locked in stasis. You want to have people able to change their valuations as conditions change. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have today. This is really a fascinating chapter. I mean, there's there's so much we could go into here. I hope you, that you are reading along. Again, we will link to the book itself in beautiful HTML format. So you can read this book at no cost uh, uh, via a beautiful a layout at Mises.org. We'll also link to the store where you can purchase either the book in paperback or hardcover form, and also Bob Murphy's study guide with a, a 10% discount using the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast. And I think we'll go ahead and link to this article from Hutt called The Yield for Money Held, because that'll that's a very interesting historical footnote, and it'll help you understand why you know, increasing your cash balance when things seem uncertain is actually, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. So it's important to to uh, to understand that uh, next week we're going to be getting into the really fun part of this book, the later chapters, which unfortunately were published separately at first, called Power and Market, and uh, all, all the ways in which government intervention you know, skews the economy and messes things up. And so this is really Rothbard expanding and categorizing uh, some of that uh, section in Human Action called the Hampered Market Economy. And, and really taking it a lot further. And we're going to have a, a great guest, Dr. Patrick Newman, as we begin to get into the end of this book. It's been a long journey. Also, next week, we're going to have a great uh, books podcast with Jeff Booth, who's maybe a name you haven't heard. He's a, a VC and a tech uh, entrepreneur, but he's written a really interesting book called The Price of Tomorrow, which which argues that deflation it may actually be our savior, despite all the depredations of government. So 
Be sure to stay tuned to the Human Action Podcast. We want to thank you, Bob Murphy, for joining us today, and everybody have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.